Hey guys. So the last time I spoke about the internet, I questioned the idea, or I actually raised it and questioned it, I guess, that anonymity makes us into monsters. That as a product of deindividuation of facts, that is the loss of individuality, the loss of the sense of the self in an anonymous online context, we can express a toxic, unhinged sort of side of the sense of the self, given that anonymous online spaces strips away social norms and rules, and while I think I made it clear, or at least I hope I made it clear, that the internet does not make us monsters, but rather just allows us to express ourselves more fully, in this second part of my sort of delve into internet effects, and oh my friends, there are many, I want to explain how the internet doesn't make us monsters, but how actually it makes us free. And to also just cover some of the more benign or even outright pro-social outcomes of deindividuation effects in computer-mediated communication. Yeah, I know that's a bunch of jargon, but hopefully by the end of it, uh, we'll get some pro-social outcomes, right? Uh, in other words, I hope you enjoy the video and uh, hope you learn something about it, something that you can relate to and use in your everyday trolling and shitposting online. You're gonna burn, all right. So I've spoken in the past, several times now, about how we form relationships with online personalities, people we don't really know, in what's typically unidirectional communication. That means that it goes out, but isn't reciprocated. And how we come to view these online personalities as our friends in what's called a series of parasocial interactions and what results in the formation of parasocial relationships. Although one may never get a retweet or a like from one of our favorite online friends that we've come to know through this unidirectional communication, we still feel as though we know these people. Yeah, I know you. I've been following you on Twitter. I've watched your YouTube videos. I know exactly who the fuck you are. You don't know me. <laughs> I've certainly been uh, guilty of this, and it's difficult not to feel close to people, particularly to people that you know online as a product of this series of multiple parasocial interactions. Every time you watch someone's video, you're kind of interacting with them. And because of the nature of newer media, Twitter and Super Chats, for example, this really isn't even unidirectional. It actually is bi-directional, meaning that there is interaction, real interaction, not just perceived. I also mentioned in my previous videos about this phenomena that one of the reasons we may tend to feel so attached to these online friends that we watch on a daily platform like YouTube, where there is often potential for that dyadic interaction I just mentioned, unlike as is typically the case with, let's say, television or movie stars, it's because they tend to do a lot of interpersonal sharing. Well, YouTubers that is. Bloggers, vloggers, people on Twitter, uh, they tend to overshare just a little bit. All of us, myself included, I'm sure. I remember back in late 2016, PewDiePie, who had been doing daily vlogs while shooting the second season of his YouTube Red Show, which was of course inevitably cancelled, Scare PewDiePie season 2, eventually more or less broke down and explained that vlogging had become too stressful. And I felt for him. I felt for him even more than when YouTube canned said season two of Scare Pewds because of the slanderous Wall Street Journal ousting our Swede as a Nazi for making a couple of harmless jukes. That's a Jew joke, haha, <laughs> get it? Please end my accents. Huh. Oh, what am I doing? Deaf to all Jews, I want you to say after me, deaf to all Jews. And, uh, you know, Hitler was right. Bad jokes aside. Anyway, part of that emotional response was because I had formed at that point a parasocial relationship with PewDiePie, having watched his unoriginal content every day for months, and part of that was because Pewds was clearly opening himself up emotionally to the audience. Just as he opens up his body as he does this. Now, why might he do that? I mean, in this case, we're not talking about anonymity right here, right? He's a major celebrity. But why would he be so open emotionally? Why would he be so willing seemingly to share aspects of the self that we might otherwise be able to attribute to this sort of strangers on the train effect that I mentioned in part one of this video? That is, as I mentioned, as a product of being anonymous, we can have both toxic and benign disinhibition. As a quick recap, disinhibition means <laughs> lack of inhibition, simply. You kind of feel like you can do whatever the fuck you want because you can. 
Because to be anonymous, to be de-individuated, means a loss of social rules and norms that would typically restrict us because we're afraid of repercussion. Again, this can manifest in a dichotomistic manner, both toxic and benign. Toxicity usually through trolling, through being an asshole, but benignity more through the strangers on a train effect, that is opening up, saying exactly how you feel. And although I covered that a little bit in the first part, that's really the crux of this video. Strangers on the train, uh, communicating openly, freely, and really getting at the core of ourselves. How that could be potentially beneficial to our sense of self. How that could be beneficial to our emotional states. To really say what we think, right? And that's because you don't even have to be anonymous or even pseudonymous to experience some of the numerous effects that computer-mediated communication has upon human behavior and interaction. In this case, we're looking at sort of what's called the hyperpersonal model of computer-mediated communication, behavior, and self-expression. Have you ever met somebody online and felt like you knew them better than many people that you know in your real life? Many friends that you know offline after just a few days? To go from literal who to besties? seemingly overnight? Well, that's not that unusual when it comes to online interaction. But early researchers interested in computer-mediated communication suspected that given the lack of face-to-face -face cues, including nonverbal communication cues, that is, facial expression, physical proximity, how close am I to you? Am I getting a little hot and steamy, a little bit too close, too hot to handle? Hand and body language. This is all lacking in at least early forms of internet communication. We've Getting a little bit different now with VR, but still, you can't touch someone via the internet. You know, outside of the Japanese with their virtual remote sex input devices. That doesn't count. Online communication and any relationships formed online, therefore, were suspected to be relatively retarded, and I mean that in the academic sense. But now you can't say that. Now you gotta be like, that's not smart. <laughs> Your idea has an extra 21st chromosome, if you ask me. Compared to face-to-face -face relationships, in what's called cues filtered out theory, the name being fairly self-descriptive, being that the cues, the non-verbal cues that I just described, were filtered out of this communication, and given the lack of cues, it would be difficult to form relationships. You don't know what someone's thinking if you can't read their body language. At least, that was the thought process. Then again, you can read someone's body language and still have no fucking clue what they're thinking. <laughs> And as such, the research started to evolve. Walther 1992, in contrast, assessed online communication through the lens of social information processing theory, which ultimately posits that despite the lack of nonverbals, online relationships are very much capable of being just as intense and deep as face-to-face -face relationships, which was not assumed in Q's filtered out theory. Pretty much said you can't do that shit. Turns out, not only can you do it, but those relationships can be extremely intense. And before we get too much into social information processing theory, or what I will just call SIPT, and hey, that's an easy way to remember that as an acronym because online communicators often take in these highly concentrated SIPs of the sense of others versus the sign of gulps of verbals and non-verbals that are expressed in face-to-face -face communication. <laughs> See? Like I said, useful acronym for once, SIP. But before I get into that a little bit more, I want to explain, briefly, media richness theory. Although I'm fairly positive I've done it before. Look, sorry if it's boring, fam, but I have to anticipate that most people haven't watched all of my garbage, so I have to reiterate sometimes. Anyway, media richness theory, as proposed by Daft and Langle in 1986, basically describes that different types of media outlets affect how we communicate with others. As with all things in social science, uh, another kind of no shit factor. But let's explain. Existing on a continuum, the media lowest in richness is pure text text, while highest in richness is face-to-face -face communication. Thus, somewhere in between lies, well, all forms of online communication, between purely voice and something as complex as video chat, or even more complex, something like VR, that we don't even totally understand at this point because it's still developing technology. What is a digital body exactly, and how does that affect our media richness? How does that affect our social presence? Whoa there, friend, you might need to slow it down. Aiden, don't get too excited about digital bodies again. Save it for another time. 
Anyway, while media low in richness is clear in its instructional ability and capability, in that text is kind of the best way to explain something complicated, it also lacks the nuance and emotional context, which is much more present in face-to-face -face communication, in anything that allows us to have a, a tone of voice to show off our facial expressions. Thereby, if it comes to something that's nuanced, if it comes to something that's emotional, well, that text can be pretty easily misunderstood. I'm sure plenty of you have gotten a text from a friend, a coworker, or whatever, and not known if the message was intended as sarcasm because of the phrasing or the context. What'd you mean by that? You know what I meant by that. This is because of the low media richness of text. It lacks nonverbal cues. Even an emoji is actually a nonverbal cue. But here we go, up further and further along the media richness continuum. And on that kind of note, there is some merit to cues filtered out theory, because there is more to text communication than merely just that. For example, when reading text, because we lack nonverbals, but we are a species that is developed to interact and communicate with nonverbals in face-to-face -face communication, given that language in and of itself, written language, language in particular is relatively new, to say nothing of media. Our minds have to kind of fill in the blanks about how we expect the cues behind the messages, the text, to manifest. One manner of which is solipsistic interjection, which is the playing out of a conversation of how another person talks, but what they might sound like when you're communicating with someone through text. And how they're going to interact and perceive your interaction. Basically, playing out in your head what the conversation's going to sound like. But online interactions, as with all communication, well, all that's not interpersonal, I suppose, is at least dyadic in nature. Meaning that we're not just perceiving and reacting to information, but also receiving and producing information in a communication exchange. In contrast, rich media conveys much more emotional information, but can make the expression of complex instructions of very detailed things a little bit more difficult to express. My point in mentioning media richness is that it's important to understand that the method through which, the venue through which we communicate online in and of itself can change how much we share and how that information is both sent and perceived. For example, online people can write giant walls of text that explain a great deal of information about the self, highlighting this information with nonverbal emojis that convey great deals of personal detail succinctly and clearly in a mere fraction of the time that it would take to disseminate that information in a face-to-face -face conversation. And that kind of info dumping, if you've never been personally privy to that online, well, let me just tell you, it's not that unusual in online relationships. Mia! I want you to know that I care about you, that we're friends for life if you so choose. But I value honesty a great deal, and I need you to be honest with me. I know that you're upset because you feel alone and feel that I have abandoned you. I haven't. I've been very busy, and when you first met me, I had extra time on my hands. It's your first impression of me, but I have many responsibilities which occupy my time. There have been several accusations where I tried to DM you even if it, even if that's all I could do. I would get a response a day or so later. Figured you were busy, but then I start hearing details about your life. Serious things that I thought you would have shared with me. I started to realize that you'd been online at times when you didn't answer. I'm not Polly. Total is the same thing. Ooh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hold on. I can do it. <laughs> I told Liz the same. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Individuals tend to disclose significantly more information, disclose more frequently, and disclose more intensely personal information online than in face to face communication. You can see Tidwell and Walther 2002 for that. As well, Dietz Uller, Bishop Clark, and Howard 2005 found that not only were people more likely to disclose extensively in online groups where disclosure was encouraged, but that they were also more likely to disclose more information in all situations that were presented to them. For example, participants reported more symptoms of illnesses online than when speaking directly to
directly to a physician. And from the stance of anonymity, it makes sense why you might be a little bit more willing to talk about the funny shape or color or smell emanating from your naughty bits on Yahoo Answers than to an actual physician face to face. I think I have a... and release more personal details in online interviews over even written ones. Online communicators experience less vulnerability and fear that disclosure could negatively affect interactions outside of the online communication as a process of the de-individuation effect. Online communication is self-contained and occurs between largely anonymous and pseudonymous individuals who generally lack some fear of offline repercussions for that communication. Now, this still affects us regardless of whether or not we are totally anonymous or even pseudonymous. We're still set apart some way. And as such, it does give us this layer, this level of disinhibition. But de-individuated persons, they need not worry about the possible negative effects of disclosure, making the internet a unique arena for self-expression. And while de-individuation is an obfuscation of individuality, it also, in a kind of ironic twist, seems to lead to greater expression and a greater need to disclose personal information. Because Honestly, why the fuck not? If there's nothing holding you back about talking about, I don't know, vibrating nipple clamps, why wouldn't you talk about it? I'm serious. This is kind of the double-edged sword of the internet, as with everything we'll talk about regarding it. Anything that has a positive effect can generally have a negative one too. Too much of a good thing, I guess you could say. But knowing what we know about anonymity and how people interact online when the true self is obfuscated, outside of true LARPing, you know, pretending to be someone else, it makes sense then that one will engage online in extended communication in what's called face work, as Goffman 1959 described it. That is, offline, when people meet you, you get to know them for a while. Not only can they see things about you, they can connect things about your appearance, what you do for a living, all kinds of other shit. Lots of context clues, right? Online, particularly in anonymous environments, there is no context. As such, you can engage in this type of face work. You can put your best face forward the desired sense of the self, the ought self, as Higgins, 1987, further defined it online. When our true self, whoever we actually are, I guess, or at least the body we inhabit, is hidden. And with the use of, for example, asynchronicity, that is that we have all the time in the world to develop the most eloquent of messages when we're online, when we're in this low media richness format, when I get to write out these long prodding videos rather than doing it extemporaneously. That kind of shit, that would typically elude us in face-to-face -face speech. Asynchronicity gives us the ability to put, again, our best face forward. Who do we want to be? The effect of this is that under certain contexts, pretty much everyone online is putting their best face forward. Not in all contexts, but in a lot of them. If we are being ourselves at all, because again, sometimes we can just be other people entirely through what's called identity tourism, which again is allowed for by anonymity, allowing us to abandon any sense of the self, pick up a different version. In terms of this face work, this ought self, this is not someone totally different. This is still us. This is the sense of the self we're trying to portray as the best version of me when we communicate with others online. Keep a note that I did say very specifically this occurs under certain contexts, not all. Hashtag not all. Going back to our previous installment, we learned that anonymity is a two-way street of toxicity and benignity. Thus, there are many contexts and situations in which face work is the least of our concerns, and that's not reflected just online, but offline as well. The first step in engaging in face work is the conscious or paraconscious decision to engage in face work at all. That is, sometimes we just want to be the biggest asshole possible because the guy sitting in front of you on the other side of the communication table is a giant piece of shit and you want to tell him to go stick it where the sun don't shine. Can you read, my son? Well, that depends. Can you go fuck yourself? But other times, perhaps arguably more frequently, we want to be the good guy, we want to be liked, we want to have positive social interactions. And although the generally de-individuated nature of the internet allows us to more easily be unconstrained pricks and tell people what we really think about them just as readily as we would as if we were a few dozen drinks in, it also gives us this very unique opportunity for face work to create and present the best possible versions of ourselves. Again, you can craft messages, you can present yourself in a very flattering way. I mean, go back and think about my space angles for fuck's sake. This is all just showing the ought self. 
Here's the thing, he's never actually met me. Well, the pics I sent were a little more flattering than I actually am, and so we just sort of had this online relationship. Mm -hmm. But the hair I mailed was mine. That was real. Keep in mind, and again, based on context, everyone's kind of doing this. At least everyone engaging in communication who isn't just having a giggle or trolling. And, you know, thereby getting, of course, some psychological satisfaction out of fucking the system of societal norms that we live in. But if we're communicating and attempting to form relationships long term through online spaces, we're pretty much all engaging in some level of positive face work. This presentation of the optimal or ideal sense of the self. To greater or lesser degrees. Some people are more prone to it than others. This is me zinging cutie 23. Whoa, 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 slow down. Zinging Cutie 23, are you pretending that you're 23 years old? No. It seems like it. No, I, it's, I, it's a random number it's that I picked. It's a random number? But again, if we're trying to form relationships, yeah, you want to be liked. You want to show the best side of yourself. I mean, it's not like people don't do this offline as well. It's just a little bit easier online when you have the asynchronicity effect, when you have the ability to stop and think very carefully about what you're about to say. This results in a kind of feedback loop, though, of ought self presentation. That is, I present a slightly fictionalized version of myself in this lower media richness environment, which allows for my communication partners to make some internal, often paracognitive decisions about how I look, how I sound, how I behave, and in response, he or she reacts to me with his or her own slightly fictionalized version of her ought self because they just interacted with me i see him pretty cool i mean i'm obviously the uh, coolest person around yeah totally but the point is everybody's doing it and thereby yeah it creates a feedback loop of positive self-presentation or perhaps more accurately in what's referred to by peak youtube scientists as a circle jerk what do you mean aren't you a scientist yeah do it no, I'm an econ major. I just wanted to look at some poop. Oh. This is what Walther's hyper-personal model of computer-mediated communications, see Walther 2007 for overview, predicts. This feedback loop of positivity, of positive face work. These highly favorable faces that are revealed mean that relative to face-to-face -face communication with all of our flaws being pretty blatantly visible, I mean, unless you're some kind of Patrick Bateman-esque motherfucker, online relationships can not only form extremely quickly through a overload of information, and be highly emotionally loaded as well. Given that we have every reason to like everybody else, we're all putting on our positive faces when we're trying to form these relationships. This does not mean, by the way, I should make this clear, that our ought self is a lie. It's more really of an embellishment. But again, people do this when they're on a first date, too. When we're making new friends. The internet, again, just uh, exacerbates the effect. It does also certainly help, though, if the information that is disseminated online is truthful or mostly truthful when it comes to taking those relationships offline, to progressing them, as assessed by Gibbs, Ellison, and Haino 2006. Basically, if you really lied about who you were online, people didn't like you too much when they met you offline and realized you weren't who you said you were. But I just want to be clear that the face work of the presentation of the ought self is different from adopting another identity, from catfishing. Those are two disparate concepts. Again, the cool thing about the internet is it allows you to do both. Double-edged sword, you can call it, uh, I would call it pure fucking freedom. But generally speaking, people are pretending to be the best forms of themselves, just in society and communication at large. Again, the internet just gives us a different venue and avenue with which to perform this shit. But because we're all engaging in it, it does form a cyclical pattern wherein everyone comes to like each other very quickly and learn a whole bunch about each other very quickly, in addition to being more comfortable in general, just revealing more information about themselves in these controlled, hyper-personal SIPs of data. See? Brought it back to the SIP acronym. <laughs> These strong and quickly formed online relationships have various positive effects. As I mentioned in the previous installment, individuals who struggle forming relationships offline because they tend to be more socially anxious may tend to share more easily online. But it doesn't just end there. Lung and McBride Chang in 2013 found, for example, in an analysis of Chinese teenagers that the presence of friends online was associated with higher social competence and life and friendship satisfaction, but not with personal self-esteem. 
of a close friend, for example, in the study in an MMORPG, who was not a close friend offline, accounted for two to three percent additional variance in social competence, life and friendship satisfaction, and self-esteem. While male participants experienced more positive psychological benefits from close offline friends, males and females experienced positive psychological benefits from online friends equally. What that all means is, is that having online friends, while it might not raise your self-esteem, it can have other positive effects offline. Basically, online friends were associated with high reports of positive psychological constructs, despite the fact that when you get online, again, there's the toxic nature of the internet and thereby a greater propensity to be exposed to things like cyberbullying, trolling, other shit that could ruin your day. At least for these Chinese teenagers, playing cooperative online games together could actually be helpful to them psychologically, at least for adolescents, who in this case, they were specifically looking at bullying victims, both online and offline. The findings in this area, however, are not entirely conclusive, given that, for example, Weedman et al. 2012 found that although individuals high in social anxiety are more likely to communicate and disclose personal information online, which is of course in line with the data from Zwicka and Donoski 2008 cited in the previous video, these high social anxiety individuals, mm, they also report reported greater instances of depression and lower general quality of life. Again, that's at odds with the findings of Ling McBride Chang. But there is a difference in that in this case, they were specifically looking at people with social anxiety. Yet again, individuals low in social anxiety experienced higher self-esteem when engaging in online communication in place of face-to-face -face communication. That is, people who don't have a lot of anxiety offline, they might not have any negative effects from having online friends, merely positive ones. And although people with high anxiety, they may have some negative effects in the form of greater depression and lower life satisfaction, they may have other positive effects in the fact that they're even able to disclose at all, given that they're highly anxious people who probably keep a lot of things inside. Now, it's just conjecture, but the data are still kind of open for some interpretation, I'd say. As always, though, we seemingly are faced with the double-edged nature of online communication, in that while the internet and the disinhibiting nature of deindividuation and anonymity may give a voice to those with, for example, high social anxiety, just as much as it does to members of marginalized or stigmatized groups, as found, for example, by Spears, Postmesselia, and Wolpert 2002, there may be negative consequences to this communication at the same time. Namely, in, as I just mentioned, the case of socially anxious individuals in the form of higher reports of depression. As always, positives and negatives on both sides. But are you starting to see how this forms a very unique dynamic on the internet based not just on what I've said here, but what I've discussed in the past about parasocial relationships? Online, we are very often pseudonymous or anonymous. This results in the loss of the typical sense of the self in the process of deindividuation. The results of deindividuation again can be toxic and forward and trolling and bullying or an excessive self-disclosure and being extremely open. Both are a response to the lack of social norms, lack of repercussions and individualization of others. As a process of toxic disinhibition, while it can lead to people who behave outside of common morality, it also makes people, in a way, way more open, as I've just described, particularly for people who often struggle with offline communication and struggle for any number of reasons. As I mentioned, it could be social anxiety, it could be because offline, you're not allowed to say those things. They're naughty, nasty words. That's the wrong opinion. You're not allowed to say that, you filthy fucking Nazi. When it comes to the long-term relationship formation though in this online space, everyone has the ability to control some level of the information dispersed and at what frequency, again, through the asynchronous nature of online relationships. As such, everyone essentially putting their best self forward online all the time, at least when they're forming relationships or on consistent platforms, because we're all putting the best self forward and because we are all doing this together or collaboratively and have this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that because everyone else seems so cool, whenever we receive any positive information about them, it is in confirmation of their coolness, it further solidifies our positive opinions toward that person. This is again how relationships form so quickly. And this doesn't just apply to people we're actually talking to, but also to our parasocial relationships with media figures as well. It creates a unique environment where people can be both the biggest dicks on the planet and the nicest, cuddliest, most lovable person you've ever met. The same person can be both. 
two sides of the same coin, all in this anonymous or pseudonymous space where relationships form at a rapid pace and social groups are destroyed just as quickly as they are formed. And such, while we may be very upset when we see people behave like complete and utter cunts online, it's important to remember that deindividuation can easily facilitate that propensity towards antinormative, antisocial behavior just as much as it can create in-group positivity and all sorts of positive effects for individuals who want to express themselves, who want to form relationships when they struggle in other ways, who want to communicate with others because their speech is otherwise hindered. But that is precisely why the internet is such a fucking amazing tool. And given that it is a tool, it has no inherent ethical or moral valence. We assign that to it. It's whatever the fuck we make of it. Be it a tool for social organization, free communication and expression, relationship formation, just a little bit of pure trollish fun. The internet. The internet. This tool is one which fundamentally changed the way humans interact, and it's why it's always fascinated me and always will. But since I've spoken a little bit about interpersonal relationships, how we form relationships on a kind of one-on-one -on -one level online through the hyperpersonal model, how we take in these sips of massive amounts of information, at least distilled information that are different from the gulps that we would receive offline with all of our non-verbal cues, I think we should move a little bit into the more positive group effects, since, oh, I love talking about group behavior. And right now is a perfect time to talk about group behavior and de-individuation effects, because there is no more apt nor currently more relevant example about how the internet affects communication and behavior in a group context than the fucking Ugandan Knuckles meme, guys. Perhaps it's a bit stale by the time I get this out, but Ugandan Knuckles or VR Chat Knuckles, whatever you want to call it, is a perfect example of the social identity model of de-individuation effects that I mentioned in the previous video. How online groups form very quickly, and they create new social norms in the absence of the typical social norms that are not present in a de-individuated space. These new norms can include anything. Behavior, speech patterns. <laughs> we certainly saw that with the Gondon Knuckles. And it can also manifest in the form of memes, which are essentially a single thought shared by many. Although I'm sure all of you are probably aware of the Ugandan Knuckles phenomena. For a quick rundown, within an extremely short period of time, like a couple of hours, what can only be described as a new society or group of individuals, and apparently that's a controversial statement, I guess, to say that a group of individuals is still a group. <laughs> and therefore very, very much able to be affected by group psychology effects or social identity effects. Anyway, this group formed in VR chat around the simple premise of using a deformed Knuckles of Sanic fame and Knuckles avatar and speaking in an assumed Ugandan accent while quoting lines from various Wakaliwood films, such as Do you know the way? and Why are you running? It's a played out meme at this point, but the formation of this group is fucking fascinating. This community quickly developed entirely new communication patterns, such as she is the queen, speed on them brothers, and This video has been flagged for racist content and offensive clicking noises. Cluck, 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 cluck. All of that shit just developed naturalistically, and for no reason. There is no association with the deformed Knuckles character and these quotes from Wakaliwood films. It just fucking happened. All of these symbols thereby became associated with some type of group membership within the VR chat community. A micro community. A group identity. And given that it's a group identity, it means that when you assume this digital body, it can potentially have some effect on your own sense of self, particularly if you embody it long term. <laughs> Oh, this is fucking interesting. The point is that when you go into VR chat and you adopt the body of Ugandan Knuckles, you are adopting a new group identity both visually through the digital presentation of your body and through the expected communication and the repetition of normative group messages. And if you do not conform to the group, then you will be ostracized in some way. Why are you not engaging in the group behavior that's expected of you to be part of our group? Funnily enough, at least to a Spurgmaster like me, I saw comments on many of the videos documenting this emergent group phenomena, basically intimating, in a joking manner, that one day scientists will be studying Ugandan knuckles. And the funny thing is, guys, um, they already are, because it's a fucking fascinating, real-time case study of the social identity model of de-individuation effects. 
And on a somewhat related note regarding VR and digital bodies, because I love that shit, another potentially positive effect of the anonymous nature of the internet, as I mentioned briefly in the previous video, is the concept of identity tourism, allowing us to explore other identities by inhabiting the bodies and trappings of another person, by pretending to be someone who we're not. This is again distinct from face work and the aught self, by LARPing as different possible selves, again. Not my aught self. That is not who I am, but who could I possibly be in another universe? Marcus and Nurius, 1986, described these various types of possible selves, in that individuals believe that they could become, or that they would wish to become. Avatars, such as Uganda Knuckles, uh, provide the potential for players or for people within any kind of online environment to experience a possible self that is unobtainable with their physical body. I can't become a delicious brown woman, but I can make an avatar that is one. Identification with an avatar as a possible self can allow for self-expression that is not physically able outside of online environments. Extant research on doppelganger avatars, for example, indicates that in regards to persuasion, people are likely to change their behavior or opinions more when the avatar looks similar to the self. You can see Fox, Balance, and Benny 2009. However, when given the chance to create an avatar freely, Players can create avatars that they believe most represent the self in a digital space, yet look highly dissimilar to the physical body, which is something that eh, still needs a little bit more further examination. But I bring that up because it's all just an example of the cool shit you can do online when you're anonymous. You don't just have to be you. As I said, you're more likely to be persuaded by arguments when you look like yourself and represent yourself online. But that's because you're kind of inhabiting a body that represents you. You can also go inhabit the body of Ugandan Knuckles and be fucking Uganda Knuckles. Or you can be someone that you've always wanted to be. This is all just cool shit, and again, I think I will have to go into more detail and do a video just on avatars because that's my fucking jam. But if it seems like I'm getting off topic, because I am, and after this huge deluge of internet anonymity effects I've just dumped on you, you may think, well, who gives a shit? You're talking about stupid VR chat groups. And that's honestly a good question, because why the fuck does any of this group solidarity? Why does it matter? Why does this relationship formation matter? All of it. All right, here's why I think it matters. For a lot of reasons, many of which I've given above, with, for example, the accelerated manner in which we form relationships with others online, you know, how it's easier for some people who are marginalized in some way, or people who have anxiety. The group norms that we create can be useful, although I'm going to elaborate, and the strong affiliations and associations that are made because we lack the context of social norms, the awkwardness of face-to-face -face interaction, the ability through asynchronicity and face work to present the best version of the odd self, all of these things, they're just interesting, but I bring it all up because the internet is really not a thing that makes us monsters. Yeah. My first video had a fucking clickbait title. Sorry. <laughs> Rused, you guys. In fact, in many ways, it makes us sort of demigods, with a fair degree of power and a fair degree of all being the person we most want to be. What this allows for is high degrees also of group cohesion, though, and that's why I think this is kind of important when we talk about why this all matters, not just from an individual level, but from a group level. It allows us to work together highly effectively, now, often the outcomes of these efforts are silly and meaningless, as Ugandan Knuckles posting, or as always, finding Shia LaBeouf's failure flag. But it can also lead to social movements, such as what we find occurring with the quote alt-right, such as it is. A movement born and bred online, in the bowels of the internet that's now rising to some degree of public influence, yet is still coordinated primarily through the internet. And it's not in any way new. As I said, marginalized groups, truly marginalized groups, they often seek out online spaces in order to create group cohesion. Morin and Flynn 2014 conducted an analysis of online Tea Party groups on Facebook and found that they developed group norms in a tight social group pattern of behavior the same way we're now seeing occurring across the so-called alt or new right movements. For example, in this study, Tea Party members sought to distinguish the group from other political groups through polarization and optimal distinctiveness with rigid group norms to differentiate the group from others. The members of these Facebook groups relied on polarized language in opposition to other groups, other political groups, to establish their unique group identity, which often took the form of attacks towards outgroups and outgroup members, but also through encouragement towards the in-group and towards in-group members. Both with the Tea Party analysis and with the current New Right movement, it is seemingly because of the de-individuated nature of the internet that allows not only for these groups to form with ease, but for ideas to be shared at all. Given that offline, minority and fringe opinions often fall prey to what Noel Newman, 1974, described in her Spiral of Silence theory. That is, that out of fear of repercussions 
caution, we tend to remain silent when our ideas are antinormative, creating a cycle wherein because we do not share ideas, they remain antinormative, which in turn discourages others from expressing the same opinion. They hold that same opinion, but because I didn't express it, you won't express it. Thus, the opinion is never expressed, regardless of how many people actually hold it. And thus, the very concept of it and its antinormative status cannot ever be fleshed out and fully understood. It cannot gain traction because no one will speak about it. And there are plenty of criticisms of silence of silence theory. But online, why would we have to worry about it? Again, we're de-individuated. We don't have to give a shit about social norms offline. Deindividuation, in its removal of social rules and norms, mitigates the spiral of silence effect. And yet, despite this great ability granted for cooperation and cohesion, perpetual does the two-sided nature of deindividuation present itself in the form of antisocial behavior just as much as it does in pro-social. While others may assign morality or ethics to these behaviors, ultimately, given the removal of social rules and norms, can we really judge? For example, trolling as immoral? Given that it's just an expression of the self that is as much an expression of the self as the self-embellishment of the hyperpersonal model of face work? I would say, you know, it's up for you to determine that for yourself. Do you think it's immoral? Or is this just people being people? The point is that while the internet may in some ways appear to make us monsters, it really just makes us free to be ourselves without hindrance. Free to express the darkest sides of ourselves as well as the most intimate and personal. Without anonymous spaces, given the current anti-free speech political climate, we would have no capacity to express ourselves. At least, some of us. <laughs> Further to the right would not. Well, many claim that 4chan, particularly 4chan's politically incorrect board, is an echo chamber for far-right ideas. It also perfectly illustrates many of the points I've been making here. People will post highly personal information, at least highly personal stories, not identifying information. They feel connected with others through a sense of similarity with bored culture. We're all part of the same group. They work together to accomplish goals. I mean, the goal again can be silly, like he will not divide us, or it can be massive, like getting Donald Trump elected. Not in spite of though, but because of the anonymous nature of the board, is this possible? By the same virtue, one can engage in identity tourism, assuming a different political identity, LARP or troll, all without consequence, exploring the sense of the self, multiple senses of the self in an environment that disallows no speech, and given the fleeting nature of posts that they are deleted after a short period of time, gives priority to no one poster, no idea, no thought, no ideology over the other, ultimately resulting in what is, in my opinion, the only true bastion of unfettered free speech left on the fucking planet. Oh, uh, better take off the, the mask. How come? I like wearing it. Uh, I know, it's just um, my family and masks. They're a bit particular. While this pure and unhindered freedom from social restraints allowed for by anonymity and deindividuation can create rabid mods and raids upon innocent websites like Have a Hotel, it can also facilitate great degrees of collaboration and teamwork by the virtue of the self same effects of anonymity. Ultimately, the internet and its deindividuated nature are a force for good, in my opinion, and regardless of the inevitable negative and antisocial effects that there may be, that may be more salient even when we consider online behaviors, even those themselves may have therapeutic effects in their own ways. So go out, my friends, troll, share, collaborate, coordinate, and utilize the uniqueness of the digital space to the fullness of its capacity. And for those of you who are self-critical and have looked at the self and said, why do I do these things? Asked, why do I behave this way online? That's not how I act offline. You've seen the things I do in the past as well as in the future. They're terrible things. I know they are. So tell me, please, why have I done them? Don't you understand yet, son? Don't you get it? I'm pointing this all out to kind of be of some use. Here's why. And we all do it. That's kind of the cool thing. Everyone does it. And I hope I've helped explain why, dear friends. I hope I've helped explain so that you can understand your own internet debauchery. Why you may feel the way you do when you form a relationship online towards that person. Why it takes about 24 hours for you to fall madly in love with someone online or completely come to hate them and want to totally wreck their shit. Why you may just enjoy trolling the shit out of someone for no reason at all. These are all natural responses to having the restrictions of the physical identity, the sense of the self that we 
we always carry with us, somewhat left it, removed and replaced with a near limitless ability to be just about whoever you want, whenever you want, to be your best self or to be someone completely unrelated to you, to do whatever the fuck you would like. The internet doesn't make us monsters. The internet makes us free. If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm Aiden Paladin, all ton of volt.